Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Jackman and I'm joining you today once again like yesterday from my bedroom, <laughs> from my bed. Um, I'll wait for Instagram to go to groups, let everyone know that I'm on. But today we're discussing um, embryo testing. So it's a little further into the discussion um, on IVF, IVF treatment, etc. But today we're going to discuss... Um, So we're getting Miss Jennifer Eccles. Hi, Jen. How are you? Good. How are you today? I'm okay. <laughs> I'm joining from my bed, but that's fine. <laughs> today I look more presentable. <laughs> there you go. Good. Good. Yes. I was just giving you a little in your introduction that you're the head of genetic counseling. And you have been, uh, you have over 20 years experience in reproductive uh, clinical genetics. Yes. Yes, I've been, uh, been a genetic counselor um, since uh, 1999, um, so oh. years, um, and I started working, um, when I graduated, I started working with couples who were pregnant, um, and mm. working um, in um, OBGYN centers and big hospitals and big pregnancy centers. And then um, as my career changed, I started shifting into the IVF world. Right. So today I was explaining to everyone out there that we're discussing embryo testing. So it's a little further along my discussion because I, you know, I've now been given little definitions on my page. But I think it's interesting because a lot of people want to know what is there and what they could possibly do. Yes. So that's what we're going to delve into. So I just wanted to say like a brief uh, overview of IVF and then we can get into the genetics and the testing of it. Okay. Perfect. So uh, infertility, as I said yesterday, uh, for all of you who joined me yesterday is basically the inability to get pregnant uh, for a year of trying and you have to be conscientiously trying active uh, frequent sexual activity with no contraception um, for at least a year. Now we kind of, break that up into age groups depending uh, like to, to when to seek counseling or when to seek further help will depend on your age so if you're less than 35 35 and less you can wait the year of trying before you seek further help 35 to 40 we say six months and at 40 years and older you know you can just come in whenever you are ready to have a child so Basically, IVF, in vitro fertilization, is one of the modalities in treating infertility. Um, there are different steps, but IVF is one. And IVF entails uh, stimulating the woman so that her ovaries could produce follicles that has eggs. We take the eggs out of the body, fertilize them outside of her body in a laboratory, and essentially, with sperm, and essentially we replace the embryo. So the combination of an egg and, and sperm forms an embryo. And this is you know, development, the early stages of the baby. So there's possibility to test the embryo to determine if the embryo has the right number of chromosomes. Every human should have 46, so 23 pairs. So 23 from mom, 23 from dad to form 46. And there are certain other things like mutations that we can test for. So especially in parents um, who desire to have a child, it could be a little daunting, especially if you think that, or you know that you may have some sort of genetic disease, either that you have the disease itself or that you have, um, you're a carrier for the disease or you have a family history of the disease. And this also further amplifies the, the importance of genetic testing. So this is what Jen and I are going to talk about today. <laughs> so, um, do you want to start off, Jen, we're talking about like typical uh, genetic testing, what it means, and then what we can offer further along? Yes, definitely. So, uh, and genetic, I mean, genetic testing is such a huge ball of wax. There's so much um, genetic testing that's available now. Um, typically, when we think about um, genetic testing, as part of uh, fertility testing, there's a couple things we think of even before we start to talk about pre-implantation genetic testing. So for example, there are many couples when they're meeting their uh, fertility doctor for the first time, the first thing they'll do is submit genetic studies for things like expanded carrier screening to see if a right. couple is at risk for certain genetic conditions 
um, in their offspring. And they'll go through these tests even before they start a cycle or start to even make embryos. And then right. once they even get into that space of, okay, well, that's all of the preliminary testing. What are we talking about testing um, on actual embryos and testing, you know, those actual samples, there's a bunch of different options. And the first option that many of us think of when we think of pre-implantation genetic testing is testing for aneuploidy, looking at the yeah. number of chromosomes. Um, and the reason we do that is because chromosome problems are one of the most common causes of um, fertility issues, including implantation failure, miscarriage, or potential health problems down the line in an ongoing pregnancy. And we all have a chance of creating embryos with chromosome issues. One of the misconceptions about genetic testing is a lot of the times we think of the term genetic as always meaning inherited. But that's actually not the case. And chromosome problems are a great example of that. Chromosome problems right. usually occur by chance having nothing to do with our family history or taking our family history. And so screening for chromosome issues is something that many patients can consider, even if you don't have a family history, because chromosome issues are so common. And, and by screening for chromosome issues, we can identify embryos that have the usual number of chromosomes and those embryos would be selected for transfer. Right. In addition to that type of testing, there's a whole host, a whole host of tests that we can <laughs> offer to couples who do have a family history of specific conditions. Um, so in, in patients that um, have a, a particular genetic condition themselves and who have already right. undergone genetic testing because they have health problems themselves, that is, PGT is a wonderful use of being able to figure out whether an embryo inherited that genetic change from that particular parent. Um, some parents have chromosome rearrangements where a piece of their chromosome is stuck to another chromosome and that right. can be associated also with fertility issues down the line. Those are things that can be detected in embryos. And then another, the, the other test that we offer in our laboratory, genomic prediction, is um, a test uh, that can screen for polygenic conditions, which are conditions that are very, very common that we, we all have heard of, things like type 1 and type 2 diabetes and um, breast cancers or other types of cancers. Uh, heart disease, things like that. Very, very common conditions. And we can screen embryos to see which embryos potentially have a higher chance compared to the rest of the embryos. And then um, patients can select embryos that are not in that high risk category and prioritize those. Right. For so there's a bunch of different options available now for couples who are undergoing IVF. Um, and it's not like Many, many years ago, none of this existed. And now there's a exactly. lot of different options for patients, which is fantastic. Right. So we're going to delve mainly today talking about polygenic um, conditions. So let's start off with defining polygenic uh, for everyone out there, because it's not, you know, a usual term that everybody will use. <laughs> it definitely isn't. So um, even though the conditions are, are conditions we're used Come to on. hearing about, right. the term polygenic definitely isn't. And really all polygenic means is um, multiple genes. So conditions mm -hmm. like heart disease, um, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, um, uh, hypertension, uh, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol, those are all conditions that are impacted by the presence of multiple variants in multiple genes. And so um, they're not the, the opposite to that or the, the, um, the, the monogenic. is monogenic disorders. And monogenic is exactly monogenic disorders means single gene. And those are diseases influence. You just need one change in one gene or both parents to have a change in that same gene to have a chance of having a child with that condition. So things like sickle cell disease or Tay-Sachs disease, those types of things are monogenic disorders. Well, uh, whereas the other conditions that I mentioned like diabetes and heart disease risk and, and so many others 
are polygenic conditions. And so right. it, it, it based it multiple genes are impacting those diseases. Right. So how could screening for polygenic diseases um, be done in the IVF setting? Right. Because we have to differentiate that you can't test an embryo if you conceive naturally. Right. We have to be able to have the embryo, which means that it's in the IVF setting, in vitro setting. Yes, yes, exactly. Right. So this is not, this is, this is testing that's actually, um, interestingly, very suited to um, couples who are undergoing IVF in the sense that right now we have a certain number of ways to figure out, well, which, if, if a couple undergoes a cycle and has a certain yeah. number of embryos that, to work with, which embryo should they choose first for transfer? So right. back in the day before any testing existed, the, it was, well, how do the embryos look? What, it, what's the morphology? And that's still very much used today. And then right. uh, eventually um, we, we learned about chromosome testing and we said, oh, we can screen for chromosome issues and use that as a way of selecting which embryo we should prioritize and pick for transfer. Um, and, and that's a super important method too. And now we have another, this polygenic testing is, a, is another way of adding a layer of information so that couples have even more information when they're choosing which embryos to transfer. So, so um, couples who have multiple embryos to choose from may elect to include polygenic testing in their testing platform and, and elect to have this testing because this information can be used then to figure out, okay, of this group of embryos that I have, this M1 embryo has, is the least likely compared to the rest to develop these conditions. And we have right. this embryo over here that's high risk for one of these conditions. Maybe we'll deprioritize this embryo. So it's a way of sort of figuring out, all right, which one should we use first? And being a, a, a couple that's undergoing IVF has that unique opportunity to be able right. to get that information compared to couples that are not conceiving using IVF. Right. So one thing that I want to just make clear to um, anyone listening is that when you do IVF, you get the eggs from the woman, you get the sperm from the man. But we have no way to tell quality based on just eggs and sperm. So we can look, as Jen mentioned, we could look at the morphology of the egg and see if there's anything that, you know, from the eyesight looks abnormal same thing with the sperm we can look at the shape of the head of the sperm we can look at the tail of the sperm we can look at the movements of the sperm but that only tells us um more or less the physical appearance of the egg and the sperm we cannot tell you genetics from just looking at an egg or looking at a sperm so many times patients will come and they'll be like you know okay you did an egg retrieval or we did ultrasound or blood work and they were like how good are my eggs and the truth is i have no clue all the blood work that we do that people like to call infertility workup, it's not really the accurate definition of infertility workup. There's nothing as an infertility workup, to be honest. What the test that you do when you see an infertility specialist, so you do an ultrasound, you do AMH, you do FSH and estrogen, that's basically going to tell us more than anything else how likely you are going to respond to the medications in IVF. It's not going to tell us to if you're going to make an actual embryo. It's not going to tell us the quality of the egg. It gives us more an idea of how the quantity of eggs that you will get once you start your stimulation. So that's something you have to be clear on, that there's nothing, there's no fertility test that will say, yes, you have good quality eggs and your husband has good quality sperm. So the only way to really tell quality now is the combination of the egg and the sperm to form the embryo and then doing this testing that we're talking about. Whether you want to do PGT8 and you ploy the testing, which is telling us, do you have 46 chromosomes, 23 from each um, parent, or you have some odd number? You can do PGTM that she mentioned, monogenic conditions. And this is if you have a specific carrier um, for certain diseases like cystic fibrosis or Huntington disease or Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So these are things you probably heard about before. Even BR, um, BRCA1 and BRCA2, these are all monogenic, meaning one gene is going to cause this disease. The, the, the defect is on one gene. Now, what we're talking specifically here today about 
is polygenic diseases, meaning there are several genes that have some sort of mutation that is contributing to, you know, causing this disease. And Jen mentioned a few of them, but could you go over the list of polygenic diseases again for us? You said diabetes. Sure. So, for example, in our laboratory, the, the conditions that are available for screening are type 1 and type 2 diabetes, uh, breast mm -hmm. cancer, uh, testicular cancer, prostate cancer, um, certain skin cancers like basal cell carcinoma and malignant melanoma, and then certain cardiac um, uh, effects like um, uh, hypercholesterolinemia, heart attack risk, mm -hmm. um, uh, hypertension, and um, things like that. So um, these are all conditions that are very, very common um, right. and have the potential to impact overall health. Um, and right. that and, and that's, um, uh, and, and none of the, and also I, I want to mention too, different from testing for monogenic conditions, which is more of a diagnostic test. This is a screening, right. test, not, if this is not a test that's going to say, oh, this is an embryo that has hypertension, or this is an right. embryo, that's not the goal of the test. And that's, and, and who doesn't know somebody who has hypertension or have one of these types of conditions in their family or know somebody who has these conditions, they're very, very common. Really what the goal is, is to be able to say of this group of samples, which one has the lowest chance of these things for overall right. improvement. And that's the goal of this testing. It's a very different testing uh, paradigm. Right. So it, it gives you a screening uh, risk assessment to yeah. say how likely is this embryo going to develop diabetes, yeah. hypertension, heart attack. But it doesn't say that this embryo will indeed develop any of these things. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And that's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, it, it, is, it is a tool to help figure out really which embryo to prioritize for transfer, you know, compared right. to the other embryos in the group of samples that you have, you know, and right. so information that can be used in that way for couples who find it beneficial to them. Um, and in the same way that, that, and that's the other, that's the other important piece too, when it comes to genetic information, it's just that it's information. The, 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 couple is going to benefit the most from that information. So in not their true. place, whether they want to have this information, whether it will be helpful to them or not for any type of genetic testing, you know, whether it be polygenic testing or any other, any other type of genetic right. testing is available. So when you're doing polygenic testing, do you get like a whole, the whole list tested or can you pick and choose what you want tested? Hmm? Great question. So in our laboratory, at Genomic Prediction, you have the opportunity to pick and choose because okay. for, for exactly the reason I just said, because the information is, is yours to, to right. have. Or, um, and so it's important that you, you get information only on things you want to get information on and, 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 um, and not get information for things that are of no interest to you or would maybe be anxiety provoking to you. Um, right. So for example, well, we have a number of couples who work with us who have children with type 1 diabetes. And they're okay. specifically coming for, for uh, PGTP. They're undergoing IVF, um, either uh, because they were undergoing IVF anyway, and this is additional testing they want, or perhaps because they're extremely worried about type 1 diabetes and want to make sure that they utilize all the testing that's available to them. But either way, these are couples that have a, a specific family history, already have a child with that condition, and want to screen their embryos for specifically for type 1 diabetes, because that's the condition that's of most concern to them. That's totally okay. And then we have other couples, for example, who are more just interested in the global health benefit of getting this information and want to um, use this, you know, and get as much information as possible. People who like right. to gather as much information as possible before making a decision about which embryo to transfer. So, so it's mm -hmm. definitely possible to pick and choose from the panel of diseases that are available for testing. Right. And you mentioned uh, that your company, Genomic Prediction, but your company is the only company doing this sort of test at this time, right? <laughs> yes, that's correct. Okay. So there are a number of different uh, genetic testing laboratories um, in the United States. And, and of that, there's a percentage that specialize in PGT, of which we're one. And then there's us that offers the PGTP, the polygenic piece. So yes, the, in, terms of, in terms of getting that testing, we're the laboratory that's offering this testing right now in the United States. Right, and in the that is very cool. <laughs> we oh, we're sorry? 
and in the world, actually, we have we have we work with IVF centers not just in the United States but all over the world for this type of testing. Oh. Nice. Yes. So, what sort of info do you actually get on a PGTP report? Hmm? So, on the report, um, for each embryo biopsy sample that we receive, and the, and the biopsy is a couple of cells that are taken from the embryo for testing. So in the laboratory, we don't actually receive any embryos. We receive right. an embryo biopsy, a sample of that embryo. And so from that sample, we run the screening. And then the report will include first aneuploidy screening, because that's a huge right. piece of help. And then in addition to the aneuploidy screening, for the polygenic diseases, it will list all of the different conditions that uh, the couple has elected to screen for. And then next to the um, each disease, there will be a list of, of different information that people can use to help interpret. So for example, it will say what the risk of the particular condition is. Let's say I just make up a number, uh, you know, 10%. And then it will what the general average risk is, whether that's, you know, let's say the average is 30%. So right now you know that you're lower than what's average. And then it'll, right. it, it'll put those numbers in, in more statistical terms and what percentile that particular embryo is in terms of general risk. And then you can look at those different numbers for all of the different embryos and be able to see, oh, this is an embryo um, that has this particular risk, which is lower than this embryo. Embryos are generally, in general, if the, if the risks are in the, what we call the normal range, it will say normal next to it, so it'll be very obvious. And then embryos that are outside the norm that are very, very high will be called high risk. So it will be right. easy for physicians and patients to, be able to flag the embryos that are, oh, this one has a high risk for this particular condition, and it'll be very obvious on the report. So there's a right. lot of information. It's actually jam-packed with information that can be used um, by clinicians as well as couples, um, but it also right on the front, it's sort of very easy to say, okay, like this, right. this, this one is flagged as this, and then the rest fall into the you know normal range or whatever the results may be. So we have one question. So it's how dangerous is the embryo testing? So basically, embryo testing across. In most senses, I should say, because in New Hope Fertility, we actually have two types of embryo testing. But the majority of IVF centers do um, the conventional standard embryo testing, which basically you combine your egg and your sperm. Um, fertilization will occur, and an embryo will start to form. This embryo splits cells every single day that it's growing. So it will start off as two, that splits into four, then goes to eight, and it continues to rapidly divide. Around day five, you get what we call a blastocyst. Now, it's called a blastocyst because the cells start to compact and then it forms like a cyst layer, which eventually goes into the amniotic cavity. But this layer is packed with cells. I'm going to draw a really, um, my version of a drawing. So please excuse it. <laughs> um, and this is how I try to help explain the thing. So this is my version of an embryo. <laughs> Um, not really drawn to scale or it's just a very simplified version. So here I have the cells that start to form around and this is like the inner cell mass, which is going to form the baby. And these cells on the outskirts is going to form the placenta and the membrane. And you start to see the cyst forming. This is a cavity and this is called a blastocyst and this is day five. Now this is about like 125 cells, let's say that is formed in this embryo. So when we go to do a biopsy, we have to make a little nick in the shell here and the placenta and the membrane layer will start to kind of come out from that little nick. When we have like three to five cells, we take a laser and we cut those cells. And this is what we send the cells, three to five cells from what would have been, the, what, what is going to form the placenta and the membrane. That is what is sent for genetic testing. So we're not actually touching what we call the inner cell mass, which is going to be the actual baby. We're taking cells from the placenta and the membranes, which is the outer layer cells called the trophy ectoderm. And we're just taking a few of those cells, which is why we take it at day five or beyond because the, the embryo now has sufficient cells. So how dangerous is this procedure? Um, recent studies have been showing that there is some risk uh, in terms of developing preeclampsia in embryos that have been genetically testing. It is an increased risk from the regular normal population and from the untested population. 
but it's not severely increased that we say all patients with IVF are going to get preeclampsia. It's a slightly increased risk. It's not a dramatically increased risk. So generally, this sort of testing is considered safe. Hmm? And this is generally the testing that we do across the board in most IVF centers. However, I would mention that New Hope Fertility does a non-invasive genetic testing, a non-invasive chromosomal screening, where we actually have the embryo. We don't make a nick in it. And we just use the fluid that the embryo was growing, growing from to test the embryo. So this is something specific to our center. Um, in the United States, at least, it's specific to our center. And, um, but most other centers or all other centers in the U.S. would do the first one I described where we take three to five cells. And this is what... Um, Genomic prediction uses that biopsy. That's what we call a biopsy. So that's done by the embryologist in a lab. And your embryologists are specialized, trained um, uh, technicians who work with the embryos day in, day out. So they know exactly what they're doing, what they're looking for. And they take these cells, and then your embryo is then frozen and the biopsy is sent to genomic prediction for testing. So genomic prediction never actually gets your embryo. Your embryo never actually leaves the IVF center where your embryo is being stored. The embryo stays safe in the IVF center, and it's just a couple of these cells that are going for testing. So you don't have to worry about, you know, if they're going to lose your embryo or anything like that because the embryo is not leaving the lab. <laughs> Exactly. So I hope I answered that. <laughs> question is, is, will it be lost in the, in, like, when it's shipped? I feel like that's a lot. That's a big question that I right. get all the time. Yes. So, um, we, I know we spoke about this is, like, a way, good way to categorize um, the embryos, especially if you have a lot of embryos. But I, I suppose that even if you have one or two embryos, it's still up to the couple if they want to know these things just to have an idea to maybe tell their child, maybe we have to screen for breast cancer later on. Maybe we should watch your diet for diabetes or high blood pressure or hypertension. Exactly. It certainly can be used in that way as well. That's exactly true. And that to have, um, uh, to have this information ahead of time could be used um, by um, the couple when their child is born to make sure that their pediatrician is aware of exactly what you said to make sure that the, all of the other things are put in place, the non-genetic things that we're right. talking about, good diet, exercise, all of those things that also impact uh, polygenic conditions, that the polygenic conditions don't just occur in a bubble, they also are influenced by other non-genetic things. Um, so mm -hmm. by putting in those those um, good practices early that can certainly be of benefit. And if there's um, a significant risk for certain things, they can certainly, of course, mention that to the doctors that could potentially care for them in a different way moving forward. And we'll learn more about this as we go. Polygenic testing right now, even though we're the only laboratory doing this as part of uh, PGT, as part of, uh, you know, in the IVF world, um, polygenic testing is not a unique test in the adult testing world. And right. lots of, there are lots of laboratories doing this type of testing for that exact reason, so that adults can go and get screened and say, okay, what should I change about um, my health behaviors and what can I improve to improve my overall health and reduce my right. developing these conditions down the line. And so in it can definitely be that, information can definitely be used in that way. And we'll learn more as polygenic can, uh, testing gets even more, uh, you know, developed. We, right. the more laboratories that are involved in this testing, the more we learn, the, the more um, this test will be able to be used and develop benefits, you know, over time. Right. We're also learning as we go, how this, can be used in the future. Right. And obviously, when you say uh, embryo is high risk for a certain condition, this is not the equivalent of saying that you cannot use this embryo in an embryo transfer to get pregnant. Yes. That's a great question. Yes. And that's a very, that's extremely important, especially for a couple in the example you just gave before, if they have one or two embryos to use and if, and if those embryos are high risk for specific conditions, does that mean we're saying they can't use them? And that the opposite is true. Um, we actually never on our reports make a recommendation for or against transfer based on these polygenic results. Um, and high risk is not equivalent to a diagnosis. 
Um, right. And depending on um, how frequent the disease is, um, high risk may still mean that there's an overwhelming likelihood that that embryo would not develop that condition. High risk just means it's much higher compared to the average. Um, right. mm -hmm. So, so um, no, it doesn't mean that those embryos can't be used for transfer. Um, and that is really not the goal of this testing. The goal of this testing is not to, to eliminate embryos from potential transfer, but rather to provide information that can be used then to, again, um, triage samples and order samples. Right. So that's a great question, though, because a lot of people are concerned about that because that is what traditional PGT testing does, you know, for when it comes right. to aneuploidy screening. If there's aneuploidy, the recommendation really is not to transfer that embryo because it's very unlikely that that embryo will turn into a healthy ongoing pregnancy and a, and a baby after nine months. Right. Um, the, the much bigger likelihood is for that not to happen. And so it makes sense to say this is not an, not an embryo that's recommended for transfer. But PGT studies are just so different. Um, and the yes. goal of the studies are just so different that we don't put that, that limitation on there. And we were very, very, when we um, started doing this testing clinically, we were very clear when we were discussing this amongst ourselves to make sure that that was the case. Right. Does genomic prediction actually do any screening for cosmetic traits? So, for example, if I want my child to have, you know, brown eyes or this colored hair or that colored skin, could you do it? Would you do it? Should you do it? <laughs> oh, um, could we maybe? <laughs> will we know? <laughs> um, and, and should we? Who knows? Um, but no. <laughs> Um, right. we don't type of screening. That's a great question. Um, because what, what can be done technically and, and what is and should be done, obviously, um, are not equivalent. Um, and right. We were also very clear in, in the beginning, and, and it, it's something that we are very, very passionate about, is we want to create tests and design tests to, to ultimately help couples, you know, have healthier children. Um, right. And the goal of this testing is not to screen for, you know, traits that um, have nothing to do with health and for, right. and for those types of things. And so it is definitely one of the questions we get as a laboratory all the time, for understandably so because of the type of, of testing that we're offering. And because polygenic testing is, is so new, it's something that's constantly being, you know, discussed and debating amongst, you know, medical people and amongst, you know, uh, everybody who's interested in this type of testing also as it should be, because when anything right. is introduced, it should be discussed and dissected. That's how we learn. Um, but yeah, yeah the, the, the down and dirty answer is no, we don't do that type of testing, you know, that, and that's not the goal of the polygenic right. study at all in our laboratory. What about intelligence? Could you test for high IQs? <laughs> Yeah, good question. So no, we're not testing for, for high IQ. We do have as part of our panel um, testing for intellectual disability, okay? Okay. Um, and so um, there, are mul and there are multiple reasons why children can be born with intellectual disability. Some of those reasons can be monogenic, relating to a genetic change in a, in a single disorder. Single disorder a single gene that can be associated with a change that causes intellectual disability. Sometimes intellectual disability can be associated with chromosomal type issues, a whole extra missing chromosome. Um, but a lot of um, children can develop intellectual disability relating again to multiple different changes that sort of add up and is caused by, by and would be considered polygenic. And so on right. the panel, we can screen um, and we'll be able to identify embryos that are considered high risk for intellectual disability. But we're not doing the opposite. We're not screening for or towards intellectual ability or right. IQ or anything like that. This is more similar to the type of screening that's already been developed by screening for aneuploidy or screening right. for conditions that are associated with intellectual uh, disability. So it falls more into that category, but we're not doing the opposite. And that's right. an important distinction, you know, because again, we're not looking for traits that don't affect 
overall health, right? Well being. Mm -hmm. Does your clinic do this heart disease testing? So New Hope Fertility、um, actually does work with genomic predictions. So if you do,、um, if you do an IVF cycle and you do decide to test your embryo, this sort of testing is definitely available in、um, New Hope Fertility. So yes, to Sweet Daisy's question, she wanted to know if this testing is available at New Hope, and the answer is yes.、Um, you're you're available at New Hope, but you're also probably available at other centers. Correct. Yes, we work、okay. with a number of different centers in the United States,、um, from coast to coast, and、um, we work with centers、um, outside of the United States as well. So, for anybody who's interested in finding out where、um, uh, what centers work with genomic prediction, you can visit our website, and we have a, a list of all of the different centers that are currently working with us, including New Hope. Right. So the question is, I have one question before I actually read the next question.、Um, so let's just say I have my embryo at Center X, and Center X doesn't offer this testing.、Uh, is it possible for me to work with genomic predictions to get it tested, or to work with genomic predictions to get my embryo at another center that has the testing? How do we go around that if I already have an embryo in storage? Yes. Yes. So it's tricky, and that. And the reason why it's tricky is because we, as a laboratory, work. You know, we we're, we consider ourselves partners in a team with、right. both the clinician, you know, in the IVF center, and the couple who are having,、uh, you know, services. This this triad, the the, the three groups, you know, are、right. all very important. And so we.、Um, We're, you know, we're certainly happy to work with anybody、um, who wants to send samples to us. But if,、right. if, and and we're always happy to help a couple coordinate testing if their goal is to go to another center to utilize our services.、Um, we hope that、um, for couples, you know, we, as a laboratory, we feel very strongly about. Uh, you know things like reproductive freedom and the ability, if, if a test is very important to you, to be able to have access to that type of testing.、Um, so we want to make sure that that couples have those options. But ultimately,、um, couples have to have a very good relationship with the center they're working with and have to have the ability to make the, the you know make that switch if they choose to.、Um, you know, and and there's a there's a plus or minus to all to all of that. You know, so. <laughs>、yeah. You know, and there's been, there's no easy answer to say. Oh, that's it. It's not necessarily always a super super simple process. But can it be done? It, it certainly can, and has been done <laughs> in some cases.、Um, but、right. it, I I always love to see、um, uh, more just、oh, wonderful relationships between couples and their clinician and whatever laboratory they're using, and that hopefully、right. hopefully the the just like. Couples choose very wisely their practitioner and want it to be a right fit. We hope we could be a laboratory that's the right fit for a lot of people, also, and that's very important. And there's no one size fits all for anybody. So we have a question that I'm going to have you tackle. Is this testing different than PGS? Yeah. So P. That's a great question. So PGS pre-implantation genetic screening that typically. Um, is what is now referred to as PGTA for aneuploidy、right. screen. So a couple of years ago, we didn't call it PGTA, PGTM, PGT.、Uh, we have now we use the term PGT, and then the last letter stands for the specific type of screening, whether it's aneuploidy screening or monogenic testing or polygenic testing. But it, a few years ago, we were using a, a bit of different. Naming、an umbrella term with S, and PGS really meant that meant aneuploidy screening, and so and explain aneuploidy. Is,、hmm? Before we go to polygenic, explain aneuploidy because not everyone will know what aneuploidy means.、Yes. So thank you. Yes. So ane when we and when we say aneuploidy screening, we're referring to、um, screening an embryo. To count the number of chromosomes in the embryo, so I always think of the chrom the chromosomes are the packages of genetic material, and there should be forty six chromosomes in an embryo. 
Um, inside all of the chromosomes are the genes. So I always think of it the way that it always comes in my head every time I'm talking to a couple about this, and, and this is what I do all the time, is it, what, part of the genetic testing is we include genetic counseling, and I want to talk to everybody that's coming through our laboratory. So, um, so we discuss this all the time. So in my head, when I think of chromosomes, I always think about getting in a helicopter and looking over the skyline of a city, like New York City. I want to see right. four buildings. In, in each, each apartment is like a different gene. So a genetic change can occur in a specific apartment, but aneuploidy screening is really saying, are there the right number of buildings? If there's a whole extra building or a whole missing building, a whole chromosome or a missing chromosome, that completely changes the nature of that embryo, just like it would change the skyline. And so an extra right. missing chromosome is, uh, is associated with implantation failure, meaning those are embryos that if they were transferred may not even implant or miscarriage. So chromosome issues are a very, very common cause of miscarriage, especially in the first trimester. Um, and potential health problems down the line in an ongoing pregnancy if a pregnancy were to continue. And that's what we mean by aneuploidy screening is literally counting how many chromosomes are there. If we see 46, we would call that euploid or normal chromosomes. Right. So then polygenic. Hmm? Yep. Sorry, I just thought of you. <laughs> that's okay. So, what was the question? No, so so I know I said so we explained um aneuploidy. So now when we talk about polygenic, we're talking about um conditions okay. that are caused by multiple genes exactly. affecting it. So these are normal euploid embryos already. We know that it has forty six chromosomes. What yeah. we don't know is that the forty six chromosomes are normal. So when you do aneuploidy, we tell you you have 46 chromosomes, good. We have the right number of chromosomes. What we don't know from those 46 chromosomes is if there's 46 normal chromosomes. Exactly. So Exactly. We're not going into the, the, the and I, to follow your exact thought, we're not going into each apartment and checking if the furniture is right. And that's right. what all the different genes are to use that same analogy. So we can look at the number of chromosomes and say, okay, we see the usual number, but additional testing is needed to look in a specific region of the chromosome, in a specific gene. There's 20,000 genes that are doing things in our bodies, so many genes that have a function. And so, so um, if we're looking at one of these genes, we can see if there's something different in that gene, if there's a genetic change. We do that if we know, for example, that uh, one member of the couple has this genetic condition that we're more worried about. Or right. um, if a member of the couple has, for example, um, a change in the BRCA1 gene, we would then be able to do testing and say, oh, we know that, let's say, mom has a genetic change, you know, called this. We can look for that particular genetic change in an embryo. That's monogenic testing. Polygenic testing is looking for genetic changes. So looking at a bunch of different apartments, and seeing if there's a genetic change. The difference with polygenic disorders is having a change in one of those apartments doesn't really necessarily do anything, but it's additive. If, if an embryo inherits many, many changes associated with heart disease, for example, their risk of heart disease will be higher than an embryo that inherits just a couple of them. You know, So right. that combination in, in polygenic testing is what um, what, what we're looking for, it's more, it's more looking at the combination of these changes versus in a, in a single gene. So it's, it's very different than, than single gene testing and very different than aneuploidy screening, which is really just counting. Is that building there? You know, is it there right. versus polygenic testing and looking more closely at very specific genetic changes associated with specific conditions? But before you do the polygenic, polygenic testing, you essentially have to do PGTA. Because it would, would it, it wouldn't make sense, actually, to test if there's something abnormal, if you know right off the bat that there's abnormal number of chromosomes. So exactly. essentially, PGTP encompasses PGTA, which is your PGS, um, in the question. And then it goes further to tell you a little bit more about the embryo than just whether it has the right number of chromosomes. Now we're looking at these chromosomes and seeing if, as she said, multiple things is missing. Exactly. So I did my little diagram, which is... Obviously not. <laughs> I draw my egg looking like an egg. So PGTA testing, you have the egg. 
This is from mom, and this gives 23 chromosomes. So the woman gives the egg 23 chromosomes. You combine that with the sperm from dad, 23 chromosomes as well. So this is IVF. We take the egg, we take the sperm outside in a lab, combine it, and we get the embryo. The normal embryo, which we call normal or euploid, will have 46 because 23 plus 23 is 46. Any reason the combination does not make 46 because maybe it didn't start off at 23 or for whatever reason, one chromosome is added or lost, then this is what you call aneuploidy. And I have a doctor's handwriting, so sorry if you can't read. This is aneuploidy, and this is 45 or 47 or any number that's not 46, essentially, is what PGT is. Exactly. Um, I hope that I clarified your question, um, Kat. If a couple had genetic testing, um, some SEMA4, and had no genetic abnormalities in common... Is there still a risk of the couple's embryo having a genetic abnormality? That's a great question. That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the quick answer, the down and dirty answer is yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, but here's why. So um, if a couple has universal carrier screening um, through this, SEMA4 is one laboratory, a great laboratory that um, offers this type of testing, um, which was in your question. Um, so if a couple has universal or expanded carrier screening um, and is not identified, and both members of the couple are not identified as carriers of the same genetic condition, that's wonderful. That's, that's great. And we know that for all of the conditions that you were screened for, that your chance of having a baby with those conditions is significantly reduced. We never say zero, but significantly reduced reduced. Um, does that mean, though, that there's a zero chance of having a baby with any other type of genetic condition? No, it doesn't. Um, there are other types of genetic conditions that can occur sporadically that are not necessarily inherited um, or other dominant type of conditions or conditions in families that are not um, screened for as part of that universal or expanded carrier screening. With that said, the, the general rule of thumb or the general you know, idea is that if a couple has no family history that we need to address, if all of the uh, expanded carrier screening came back negative, if all of that stuff comes back negative, we say the general chance of having a baby with any type of birth defect, genetic disease, intellectual disability, health problems ranging from, you know, birth defects that could be very, very mild to more severe is, is three to five percent. That's a chance that we all have. You, me, everybody, we all have that chance. Look, fortunately, we can't screen and we can't screen for everything and we can't detect everything. Um, but fortunately, once a pregnancy does occur, there are certain things that can occur during a pregnancy to address that three to five percent risk. Things like sonogram, other screening that you can have, non-invasive um, uh, prenatal testing, CBS and amniocentesis are available to address certain types of conditions. So there are a host of other tests that can be performed once a pregnancy occurs to look at a developing baby and see if there are certain things that should be screened based on the way that the baby is growing and developing. Um, so I hope that helps answer the question. Um, and, and regardless, it's still wonderful that that screening uh, did not, does not show that both members of the couple are carriers of the same condition. By the way, if a couple um, does, is a both carrier of the same genetic condition, well, what's the option for that couple? PGTM, you know, so we have options for those couples as well. Right. And it's a good thing that you highlighted the fact that what, when you say that it's negative, like you don't have genetic abnormalities, you have to remember it's for what we tested. So we don't test for every single genetic disease out there. We don't know every single genetic disease out there. And we don't have tests for every single genetic disease out there. So it's just meaning that for what we have tested, it, it is negative. And it's the same thing with your embryo. For what we have tested, it is negative. It's not to say that the embryo has no potential to have anything. It's just for what we have tested, which is why even a tested embryo that has a way higher chance of implantation than a non-tested embryo is still not 100% because it's not the only factor. It's not just the test because there are things we don't test for. But remember that to, to accomplish a pregnancy, it's not just a healthy embryo, which is a major important factor. It's also your uterus. It's also your hormone levels. It's also your nutrition. 
it's a lot of other things that come together to make, you know, the embryo implant and continue to have a pregnancy and a healthy baby. So a lot of times people assume, well, my embryo is normal. Why didn't I get pregnant? And it's like, well, it's normal for what we tested. And most times people do PGTA. So what we're really saying is that it has normal chromosomes. That's all we know. And when you do PGTA, it has normal chromosomes. We're not saying the chromosomes are normal. We're just saying it has 46 of them. Um, but even if you did further testing, like you tested for monogenic conditions or you tested for polygenic conditions, the point is it's only as normal for what we tested. Right. So we still don't know what else may go wrong, as well as it's not just the embryo. Fertility encompasses way more than just the egg, the sperm, and the uterus. There's like a whole other sort of factors. So this is very important to know, which is why IVF, which gives you your highest chance of pregnancy, is still not 100%. Mm. Exactly. So yeah. true. Yep. Yep. So true. There so, there's so many factors that but besides normal aneuploidy screening or, or or other types of screening all of that's very important um but there's so many other things that you know impact um uh you know the ability for that embryo to to implant and move forward in an ongoing pregnancy that's why that's why the implantation rate is not 100 percent after aneuploidy screening if it would just matter to right. aneuploidy and if aneuploidy screening was perfect, then every embryo should transfer. And we know that that's just not, that's not, that, that's not going to happen. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Does anyone else have any questions? I'm just going to scroll through the chat to, to see if there were any questions we missed. Oh, and she's like very helpful. So thank you <laughs> for the explanation. Yeah. Is there anything else that I didn't ask that you think is important for people to know about this testing? The, the only other thing I want to touch on, and all the questions you asked were so fantastic. The, uh, the only other thing that I want to add, and I mentioned it very briefly, but I do want to discuss the importance of genetic counseling as part of this process. And, and, oh, yes, and being able to have um, these discussions with you know, these initial discussions with your IVF clinician and ask, you know, and answer all the, you know, all, get all your questions answered. And then once you make a decision, let's say to, to have polygenic testing or to consider polygenic testing, what we do in our laboratory is then you, you make an appointment to speak with a genetic counselor, me, um, and then um, <laughs> and we discuss for, for a while all of your questions and really get into the nuts and bolts about this testing so that you can really decide, a couple can really decide whether this is information that's helpful or not. And I think that that's a very important piece of the puzzle. We make genetic counseling an essential piece of um, uh, the testing process for all couples that are either having polygenic testing or monogenic testing or, or who have a rearrangement because the nuts and bolts of the testing is very complicated in some cases. And we want to make sure that everybody has a clear idea of what um, the testing entails and make sure that couples get their questions answered and genetic counseling. And, and that's what genetic counselors do. I, I like, I feel like we're translators in some way. We translate genetic information, into <laughs> right? Just like clinicians do, just like doctors do. And we want to make sure it's very, very important to us as a group that if a couple is considering genetic testing for whatever it is, that, that the couple can make a decision and decide for themselves whether that information is helpful to them. And if that, and if that's hap if that happens, then we feel we did our job well, because then the couple has the tools that they need in order to, to decide um, whether that test is right for them. And so um, if there are any couples out there who are watching, who are, have any questions, you're always welcome to um, reach out to me um, through genomic prediction to answer any questions. Um, and, um, and, and that doesn't just go just at, in general, if you have any questions about expanded carrier screening, you know, the laboratory in most cases that you have the screening through has genetic counselors, you know, so it's important to be able to use, we want to make sure that all of those resources, um, are available and that couples have the opportunity to use those resources, you know, to their advantage, but uh, everybody's always welcome to, to reach out to me with any questions. And we actually have a lot of material on our website about polygenic testing that you can go and, and, and all of our testing options that you can go and learn more about them. There's one question um, from Mrs. Bynum. So it's, 
is genetic testing covered by insurance? Hmm? Good question. Um, mm -hmm. So it depends on the type of genetic testing. Um, and it depends on the type of insurance you have and whether your policy covers uh, genetic testing in general. Um, I am definitely not the expert on insurance at all. Um, I, I can't answer it fully, but usually um, uh, I've had couples who have shared their successes as well as their not their their unsuccessfulness in getting <laughs> in cover. Um, sometimes couples um, who have a very strong family history of something specific and have a, a specific genetic condition have been able to use their records to um, get coverage through their insurance if their insurance has those types of um, you know even offers some some type of uh, PGT. Oh. Coverage, um, but it's very it, it it really it a lot of it also depends on the type that you have um, and whether the laboratory you're working with um, you know accepts that type that insurance and and all these other things that are outside of the scope of my expertise for sure. I'm sure you yeah. also have, you have an opinion about that too or information. Yeah, I'm not. Once again, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I think generally most times these costs are out of pocket. And this is just from uh, anecdotally from what I've observed in patients. It's usually an out of pocket cost. But if you really have a strong insurance and you can uh, show the need, very few insurances may cover part of it. But generally, I've seen most patients have to pay for this out of pocket. And remember, this is additional testing, additional information. So it's not something that you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely something that you can consider to give yourself more information. And it really helps you to categorize which embryo to transfer. So remember this specific PGTP that we're talking about today with polygenic conditions is not a diagnostic test. It's not saying that your embryo has. It's saying that your embryo is at risk of. And a lot of these conditions, if you think of them, we talked about diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, heart attack, uh, testicular cancer, breast cancer. A lot of these conditions are conditions that are going to develop much later on in life. It's not something that's going to happen likely in childhood um, for most of these conditions, maybe type 1 diabetes. But for the other conditions, most of them are not going to happen even in childhood. So it's something to, to guide your decision, especially if you have multiple embryos. You can categorize which one I want to... Um, transfer first and you know which one i would transfer last and it doesn't mean that these embryos are ever going to get these conditions it's just a risk and you're given a risk assessment so these are just things to bear in mind with this particular test whereas uh, pgta is giving you a specific answer and pgtm is like you know giving you a specific answer this one is more giving you a risk assessment um to work with so it's informational I hope I, we answered your question. I know we can get down to it. Um, <laughs> this is like so categorized, you know, you usually have like somebody who covers insurance, which is not me <laughs> or Jen. But as I said, from my observation, um, it's usually not fully covered. Yeah, and it definitely depends on the specific type. I, I totally agree. Polygenic testing is, is not going to be covered by insurance, at least at this time frame, because it's very, very new. But some of the other types of, the, if, again, if they're monogenic testing or, or if you have strong insurance that covers um, aneuploidy screening in, in lesser cases, then it may be possible. But it definitely is, is it's not a cut and dry, not a cut and dry uh, uh, question. <laughs> Okay, so um, I think we're going to wrap up because we're getting close to the one hour mark and Instagram usually counts us down. <laughs> so I really want to thank everyone for coming. It was a very informative uh, discussion. I really want to thank you, Jennifer, for spending your time explaining this. This is a very new revolutionary test that I think has so much potential to help a lot of couples out there looking for this information and able to utilize this information to make the decision into which embryo to choose. Um, so I want to thank you very much. Any thank words you. that you want to say before? <laughs> no, thank you so much. Thank you so much for speaking with me too. And, and, and I mean, this is my, this is my favorite topic to talk about. <laughs> I, appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you talking about it with me too. I really do. And I, I always learn something when I, when I talk with you. So thank you so much.
No problem. You see, Instagram has already started to count us down. We're on 25 seconds. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up today. If anyone has any questions, feel free to message me or you can message Jen mm -hmm. at Genomic Prediction. Let me write it in here. And it's also on the flyer if you saw the flyer for this. I'm not typing quick enough. Mm -hmm. It's at Genomic Predictions, guys. I think we're going to get cut off. Yeah.